Too many Christians identify themselves with the sick trying to get healed. You need to change that thought. You are not the sick trying to get healed. You are the healed of the Lord that the devil's trying to make sick. Amen. <laughs> That's awesome. Awesome testimony. Glory to God. God is so good. Amen. He's faithful, isn't he, church? Yes. God is faithful. He always is faithful. He'll always remain faithful. Amen. Amen. Well, how'd you guys, did you guys have a good lunch? Yes. Amen. Yes. Where'd you guys go to go to eat? There. Panera's good. Taco Rock. Mm, that sounds good. Okay. There we go. All right. All right. Well, let's get into the teaching. So, oh, we have, um, I'll get them next time. Yeah, I'll get them next time. Thank you. Um, all right. Awesome. Uh, we're going to get into the teaching, but before we do, um, I've got some questions. And then I know we had some questions come in yesterday for, for me, uh, and I didn't get a chance to answer them yet. So we're going to run through some questions this session. I don't think it's going to take all session, but who knows? We'll see how long it takes to get through some of these questions, uh, because I do want to answer them. So continue to bring in those questions for me or Brother Matt. Uh, you've got me for the next six sessions. And so uh, I'm like, yes, here we go. So, and then you'll have Matt again tomorrow afternoon. So keep those questions coming in. But um, his question here says, why do people, um, yeah, why, sorry, why do some people lose their healing? Uh, and then I think it's like a two part question. It says, difference between healed and some made whole. Good question. So, why do some people lose their healing? Well, uh, some people lose their healing. Well, they're. they're there could be a couple of reasons why someone would lose their healing. Uh, one of them is something that God has established, not even technically kingdom law, but it's actually, which is, it is kingdom principle, king, kingdom system, kingdom law, but it actually was established at the foundation of the earth, and that is called sowing and reaping. Okay? So, because the Bible says in Galatians, you know, God is not mocked. Whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Okay? Uh, and back in Genesis chapter 8, uh, well, God says, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest remain, right? And so we know that sowing and reaping is actually just a principle upon the earth. And, and believers, you know, believers get it. I mean, obviously believers should understand that. That's kingdom. It's, it's what we should do. But even unbelievers get that. The heathens get that. I mean, there was a, there was a gentleman who actually owned J.C. Penney uh, who, who lived by that principle that he gave away 90% of his uh, income and kept 10 percent, and God. And, and now watch. He understood. Now you know, I don't know. If, I can't honestly say if he was a Christian, if he was a believer or not. He may have been. I don't know. Uh, I've known other people, businessmen, business women, um, that have that maybe are not born again or have not been born again, uh, but lived by being generous people. And because they were generous givers, generous people, uh, they were also very blessed. Okay, uh, it's just a it's just a principle. Now we we, can, we now we're not just talking about finances and money, but whatever you sow, because the Bible says, "Whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap." And so some people can lose their healing because of what they're sowing. Okay. In other words, uh, you know, if you if I go to pray for somebody who is dealing with emphysema because they are a chain smoker, and I and I set them free, and I, I lay my hands on them, get them set free, they're breathing good, they feel good, and then the next thing they do is they light up a cigarette. Right? Come on. Now, I'm going to tell them, listen, you need to stop doing that or something worse may happen to you. Is that not what Jesus told people? Stop sinning unless something worse would now happen. Right? And so sometimes we actually... Okay, we, a lot of Christians want to blame the devil for everything. And, and the devil does a lot of stuff. I mean, he has the ability to do a lot of stuff. And he is up to no good. But not everything is his fault. Sometimes it's self-inflicted wounds, right? And so sometimes you got to look, okay, is this something I did or is this something he did, right? Because if it's something I did, then i got to change something because I don't want to reap the, reap the... Now watch, sowing and reaping works both ways. You can sow good things and reap great things. I mean, you can sow some bad things and reap pretty bad things, right? And so that could be one reason someone would lose their healing. Now, what is the enemy? The enemy comes to what? He is a thief. He is a stealer, right? He is a robber, okay? If you have a, a, a thief come into your house, uh, let's say they break in, right? Do they have the authority to break into your house? No, they don't have the authority to break into your house, but they can come in. Now, if you leave your door unlocked, you leave your door open, 
right? That was, that's kind of dumb on your part. <laughs> you shouldn't have left your door wide open for them to come in. They still don't have authority to come in there, but he's a thief. He has the ability to come in there and to steal from somebody. Now, if somebody gets set free, in other words, what I'm trying to get at, if somebody gets set free from sickness and disease, why, why I mean, you know, I broke into that house once, the enemy might be thinking, maybe I can break in again. This is why, now listen, this is why deliverance without discipleship will always lead to more deliverance. I'll say that again. Deliverance without discipleship will always lead to more deliverance. Now, I've had somebody ask me this question. Well, if we can't disciple them, we shouldn't deliver them? No, that's not what I'm saying. But we should disciple them. You know, you'd be, well, I don't have the time to disciple them. Should I not deliver them? Again, you're not people's, watch, you are not their judge. You are their deliverer. Hallelujah. You're not to judge whether they should be free or not. You are just to set them free. And as Jesus set people free, he said, follow me. Right? That's the discipleship part. You know, you can't force them to get discipled or want to follow you or want to be a part of your discipleship or life team, you, but you need to offer it to them. And then there's another sacred cow, I'll destroy this sacred cow, is this is another sacred cow that's actually becoming very popular again. I've actually heard a lot of it um, through phone calls I've had and different people I've talked to lately, is that we shouldn't set people free or we shouldn't deliver them because if we deliver them, they might get seven more demons that are worse. Have you heard that? Yeah. Right, that's a sacred cow. That's a sacred cow. Now, the Bible does say, Jesus does say, that when you remove a demon, when you deliver somebody of a demon, it says that the demon wanders in the dry places. He, he doesn't like the dry places. He doesn't like those places because that demon can't manifest and can't uh, do what he wants to do. He needs an entity. He needs a body. He needs a human to be able to either attach to or reside in so that that demon can display his characteristics and the things that he likes to do. Right, And so he doesn't like the dry places. He wants to have a house to habitat, or to, to take up habitat in. Okay? Now Jesus says if the demon is cast out and he returns later and he finds that the house is cleaned and swept, it says that he could bring seven more of his friends and the situation would be a whole lot worse. But see, there's the thing. You, they shouldn't come back and find the house empty. If the person has been delivered, they should come back and find the person full of the Holy Ghost. Because how I many you know if they're full of the Holy Ghost, there ain't no room for any demons in there anymore? Come on, I mean, the spirit of light and the spirit of darkness can't dwell together. On the, in the very beginning, when God said, let there be light, He said He separated the darkness from the light, and He said that the light was good. But you know what? He said absolutely nothing about the darkness. He said the light was good, and He separated the light and the darkness. Light and darkness will not, will, can't come back together and dwell together again. He separated them. Right? And so you can't have two different spirits residing on the inside of you. You're either going to have a spirit called holy or a spirit called evil. Your, your spirit is either going to be full of light or your spirit is going to be full of darkness. You're not going to have two different types of spirits that people say, well, can Christians be possessed by a demon? Well, if they're truly a Christian and full of the Holy Ghost, no. Now, can they be oppressed? Yes. There's a difference between possessed and oppressed. Oppressed would be, you know, oppressed would be like me, you know, if I was to go back there and jump on the back of Matt's back, you know, he's a pretty small guy and I'm a pretty big guy. That'd be pretty, that'd be some oppression, wouldn't it? <laughs> right? He would have a hard time carrying me around, wouldn't he? That's the picture of oppression. Very, basically carrying this huge weight on your back, and it's so hard to carry it and deal with it. That's the idea of oppression. Possession is when that thing actually takes up residence inside of you, and now it begins to manifest through you. See, there's a difference. But, but people can lose their healing for multiple reasons. The enemy, he's sly, he's sneaky. He will try to come back to people to try to see if he can get back in that house again. Is there still a place for me there? And that's why we need to teach people that when the enemy does try to come back and does try to, like for instance, you know, uh, if you know, we just shared a testimony of a, a woman being healed of her back at lunch, you know, thank you for inviting her. That's part of discipleship. Get her in here, get her trained, get her equipped, right? Great. You know, but we need to teach them, listen, if the enemy does try to return and that back pain tries to return, you, ref you, you refuse it to exist there. You tell it, no, you will not come back upon me. I've been set free. I've been delivered. So just leave right now. And see, there, then you don't have to rely on somebody else always setting you free. You can set yourself free. 
See, I, people are always relying on another man to get their hands on them when you've got your own hands that you can just say, I am healed and set free in the name of Jesus. And you walk in it. You don't have to rely on somebody because there may be a time where you don't have somebody else to pull upon. And it may just be you and God, and then you've got to be okay with it just being you and God and get the job done that way too. Amen? All right, so people, yeah, yeah, you can lose your healing. But again, you know, uh, we need to be discipling people, pouring into people, raising them up and teaching them these things. So uh, another question, uh, it says, we have been taught that it is God's will to heal everyone or everyone be, you know, be healed, which we've been looking at that. Why then does someone... um, with such great faith and experience, you know, such as we're going to give the example of Curry Blake, okay, uh, not have 100% healing. You know, because I had somebody ask me yesterday, uh, have you made mistakes? Have you had failures? And I was like, absolutely. You know, he said, has Curry had mistakes? Has they, have they had failure? Has he had failures? I said, yeah, absolutely. Why is that? And the answer to this is pretty simple. We're all growing. We're all growing up into Christ Jesus. We're all on this path. <clears throat> We're all on this journey. And I actually want to read something to you really quick. If you go to, grab your Bible, this isn't in your manual, but this is in your this is in manual number one. Okay, so go to manual number one. And go with me to Luke, <clears throat> real quick. Luke chapter 2. Uh, let's go to Luke chapter 2, and let's start in, let's see here. Let's start in verse 41. Let's kind of just set the stage for what's going on here. Start in verse 41. It says, his parents went to Jerusalem. That's just talking about Jesus' parents. Uh, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went to the, up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days as uh, as they returned, the boy, Jesus, lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went about a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. Now, this is interesting because here they are. They're traveling back from Jerusalem back home to Nazareth. They're in a, they would have traveled, you know, by convoy, because you know you wouldn't have traveled alone those days on desert roads. It would have been a convoy. It would have been you know all your relatives, family, friends, pretty much everybody from Nazareth. Which we've been to Nazareth. The, the original city is very small. Uh, maybe like maybe six or eight of these. It was it was it was very small. So everybody knew everybody. Everybody knew. You so you traveled together, and so here it is. It's a day's journey, and they've lost the Son of God. That's not good. <laughs> Okay, they have lost Jesus, right? And so they are, they're asking, nobody knows where he's at. So when they, when they did not find him, verse 45, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now, it, now so it was that after three days, everybody say three days. Three days. <clears throat> now, how many mothers in the room? How many ever lost your children for three days? <laughs> Let me ask you this question, moms. <laughs> what kind of position would you be in if you were missing your child for three days? You would not be in a very good position, would you? You'd be, can I ask you this? Would you be a little worked up? Now, if it was the Son of God, would you be a little bit worked up? <laughs> You're like, oh my gosh, we lost God's Son. But watch this. So I'm sure they're pretty anxious right now, right? And so it's three days later, it says here. Um, and it says here, they, they, they did not find him. We went to Jerusalem seeking him. Now, after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not, watch this in verse 50, they did not understand the statement of which he spoke to them. Then, verse 51, then they went down with them, he went down with them and came to Nazareth, Nazareth, and he was subject to them. Ooh, you know what that means? He got grounded. (laughs) That's a little bit of a punishment there. You're now subject to us, right? And so now watch this next part, though. So he was subject to them, and it says here, but his mother kept all these things uh, in her heart. And verse 52, here's here's the kicker. Here's Here's the part that I want you to see. And Jesus increased. 
Everybody say increase. increase. Okay. The Greek word there for increase is, it has the definition of growing. So we could say, and Jesus grew or increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. So what's that tell us? If Jesus had to grow, you've got to grow. Why? Because if Jesus is our model, if Jesus is our example, if Jesus is what I call the prototype son, where he is the bar, he's the only bar, because we cannot, we cannot line ourselves up against anybody else. You can't want to be like the disciples, because the disciples had failures and faults. You can't want to be, I've heard preachers and ministers say, we need the spirit of Elijah to return to the church. And I'm like, no, we don't. We don't need the spirit of Elijah. We need the Holy Spirit to return to the church. There's only one spirit I want in the church, and it's the Holy Spirit. Amen? I, I, you can't line yourselves up, you know, like Brother Matt was sharing about Job. So many Christians, well, I'm just like Job. I'm just like Job. I'm just like Job. You're nothing like Job. Stop calling yourself like Job. You've got a better covenant with better promises. I'll ask you this, because uh, I, I, I don't think you asked this, but I'll ask you guys this. What covenant did Job have? Some of you heard, some of you said it, none. He was actually before the Abrahamic covenant. Now, now let's, just, let's just for, you know, just for argument's sakes, let's just say he did have the Abrahamic covenant. Okay, let's just, let's just say he did. Are you in that covenant now? You're in the covenant between the Father and the Son, an unbreakable, eternal covenant. A covenant, like I said, with better promises, you know, uh, better provision, uh, all, all of these things. Amen? And so you can, you're nothing like Job. You're like Jesus. Amen. The only one you can line yourself up to is to Jesus. Jesus is the mark. Amen. He is the measurement. Amen? And so we can't examine ourselves against anybody else. But watch this. If Jesus is the mark and Jesus is the measurement of which we are to attain to, then if Jesus had to grow, what's to say we don't have to grow? We've got to grow. We've got to grow into the fullness of a son. Now, that leads me into my next thing, and I will get to some of these questions when we get back next time, because I want to actually hit this section while we're talking about this. So go with me in your manuals to page 52. Page 52. I know we're going back backwards just a little bit, but we're going there for a reason, because this is very important. Uh, you need to know this information. Um, and so in, in section, no, not section 52, but on page 52, you're going to see at the top of your page, it says, like Jesus. Like Jesus, okay? Uh, now look at this. Now, it says here, it is enough that the servant be as his master. Matthew chapter 10, starting in the 23rd verse, it says, but when they, when they persecute you in, a, in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. He says, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. But watch what Jesus says in verse 25. He says, it is enough for the disciple that he be as his master. Everybody say, it's enough. It's enough. See, when Jesus said there, it's enough, what he means is he says, it's good. It's perfect. It's good that, that the disciple be just like. Now watch what he says, be, be as, which means be just like or be as his master. And the servant, watch this, as his Lord. Well, who's the Lord? Jesus. Are you servants? Yes. Now watch this, you're servants, but you're sons who get to serve. Yes. You get that? Remember Jesus, and um, yeah, I don't think I'm actually going to read this one. There was another thing, I think it's in John. He said in John to his disciples, he says, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. Why? Because a servant doesn't know what his master's doing. But how many know a friend knows what a friend's doing? Yes. Come on. How many got a best friend? Yes. Come on. I know my wife is my best friend, right? I talked about that yesterday. I can finish her sentences. We, can, we think the same things. We, you know, when we say, hey, where do you want to go eat? And she says this. Well, I was actually thinking the same thing. We're best friends. We, we like to do life together. Amen? And how many of you know a best friend knows what a best friend wants? Right? That's why Jesus called them friends. Now watch. He could not yet call them sons or brothers. Not sons. Well, he would have called them sons too. But he yet couldn't call them brothers. Why? Because he hadn't went yet to the cross, to the grave, and resurrection. Now watch. When he comes out of the grave, and the first person who appears to him is who? Mary. 
Right? What does he tell Mary? Go tell my brothers. Wow. He didn't say go tell my friends. He says now go tell my brothers that I'm ascending to my father and their father. See, what Jesus had accomplished through this death, burial, and resurrection was he adopted a family. He, he brought the family of God back into God. And the Bible actually says that you've been brought near to the Father by the blood of Jesus. Amen. Everybody say, I'm adopted. I'm adopted. How many of you know, you could be born into a family, but that family may not want you. But when you're adopted, you're chosen. That family wants you. God adopted you. He chose you. He says, that one, that one, that one, that one, that All of them, I want them. Amen. They belong to me. Amen? So I, you've been adopted. Now watch this. Jesus says here in verse 25, he says, it's enough. It's good. It's meat. It's enough that the disciple be just as his master. Now, think with me for a minute. You don't have to turn there. It's not in your manual. But think with me for a minute. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. What does it say in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26? Anybody know? I'll quote it. It is very good. Actually, the scripture is very good. Watch this. <laughs> it says, let us create man in our image and in our likeness. Watch what it says there. Let us. Us is not singular, is it? Us is plural, isn't it? So that tells me the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit stood there and said, let us create man. Now that word man is all dumb, Adam. Right? You are, you are born of Adam, all dumb, man. Let us create man in our image and in our likeness. You, you were originally, your original creation, the original intention for you was to be created to be just like your heavenly father. Amen. People say, oh, that's impossible. How can we be just like God? Well, why does it say in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul says, be, be mimickers or be imitators of your heavenly Father as dear children. Come on, church. That word imitator means to mimic your heavenly Father. Whatever you hear your heavenly Father say, you better be saying. Whatever you see your heavenly Father do, you better be doing it. I don't know about you, I had a good upbringing. Some, some people didn't have a good upbringing. I had a great upbringing. And I remember you know, my father, whatever my father was doing, I wanted to be with dad doing it. If dad was out chopping wood, man, I wanted to be out there with my axe and my boots and helping dad. And well, He wouldn't let me chop when I was little, but I wanted to. You know, I wanted to be just like dad. If dad was working on the truck, man, I was out there with him. I had my elbows in grease and with tools because I wanted to be like dad. Right? And every child, I think, in a good upbringing, that's why I say everybody doesn't have a good upbringing, but in the most, in good upbringings, you look up to your parents, you look up to your father, you look up to your mother, you aspire to be like them because you see greatness in them. And the same is in the spiritual. You should look up to your heavenly father and want to aspire to be just like your heavenly dad. Right? Because it's good. Watch what it says here. It's good that you, the disciple, everybody say, I'm a disciple which means you're a student, which means you're learning, which means you're growing. But it's good that the disciple be just as his Lord or just as his master. Now think about this for a minute. Didn't Jesus say, the same works that I do, you will do. And not only the same works will you do, but greater works will you do because I go to the Father. Jesus said you would actually do greater works than him. Now listen. Any, and I'm going, to, I'm going to put this in quotations, because it needs to be in quotations. Any good teacher, because there's some teachers out there, but they ain't good. There's some teachers out there that will keep you, um, how do I say this? They, they will keep, they, they want to be needed, so they'll keep you where they want to keep you. They'll keep you at a certain level, because they want to be needed, and they want you to show up every Sunday or every Thursday or whatever day of the week you're going to see them. They want you there. So they'll keep you at a certain level rather than growing you up into the fullness and actually sending you out to do the same thing they're doing. That's a bad teacher. That's a boy teacher, not a mature father teacher. But watch, a good teacher... Now, I say good teacher. Why? Because a good teacher will always want their students to actually excel them. Because if I actually see you doing something, you grabbing a hold of this message, but then actually running past me and going further than I ever went, I'm going, yes, I did my job. They're actually doing it. They're running with it. They're going farther than I ever went. See, Jesus wants you to go farther than he ever went. He wants you to do greater than he ever did. And he knows that you can because he said you're just like him. 
Now look at this, Luke chapter 6, verse 39. And he spoke a parable unto them. He said, can the blind lead the blind? Shall they, watch, shall they not both fall into a ditch? The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Everybody say perfect. perfect. Okay, all the perfect people, raise your hand. Oh, there we go. <laughs> now, we probably would agree there's probably nobody in this room yet that is perfect. But the Greek word for perfect here in the, in the, in the Greek is actually mature. Okay? So it, watch what it would say. But everyone that is mature, because I mean, there's a time of coming of age, right? You're, there's a time where, you know, you hit 18, and I know some 18-year-olds that still act like 12-year-olds, but, you know, there's a time when you, it's not so much an age anymore, is it? <laughs> it's a maturity level, yeah. right? Why? Because you could have, I'll be honest, I've, I've known Christians that have been born again for 40 years, and then I've known Christians that have been born again for one year, and the one-year-old is more mature than the 40-year-old. So maturity has nothing to do with age, right? It has to do with you walking in the fullness, you actually grasping a hold and doing. And so watch what he says here. But everyone that is mature or everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Look at this. He said, and he gave some. Who did this? Jesus. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, I want to actually read this out of the Weiss real quick. So this Weiss translation, which we have some back there, but this, this Weiss translation, I know uh, Brother Matt shared a little bit yesterday about how this was put together. Basically, Kenneth Weiss uses many Greek words, or yeah, as many English words as necessary to make you or help you understand what it would mean in the Greek. But listen to this, because I shared this on day one about the fivefold or fourfold ministry, right? Watch what it says here. It says here in, uh, in verse 11, <clears throat> let me find my spot here. Yep, here he is. He himself gave some on one hand as apostles and on the other hand as prophets and still again some of bringers of good news and finally some as pastors who are also teachers. For the equipping of the saints. What are these ministers for? For the ministering, watch, for the equipping of the saints, for the ministering work with a view to the building up of the body of Christ. So the fourfold, now watch this, I'm going to show you something here. The fourfold or fivefold, however you want to look at it, I mean, you want to call it fivefold, that's fine. Technically, according to the Greek, if you understood Greek, it's fourfold. It's apostles, it's prophets, evangelists, and pastors who teach, right? Those ministers, fivefold, fourfold, they are there not to do the work of the ministry, but to equip you to do the work of the ministry. See, we always look at the pastors, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, whatever you want to call them, we always look at them as the ones doing the work of the ministry. They are not the ones, now, they will do the work of the ministry, but they're not the only ones that are supposed to be doing the work of the ministry. They're to be there training you up to do, equipping you, building you up, perfecting you, which we'll see here in a minute, for the work of the ministry. Watch what it says there in verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints. Everybody say perfecting. perfecting. That's, what, that's, what, that's why God gave, or Jesus gave these ministers to the body, was to perfect you, to perfect the saints. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying. Now, that word edifying means building up. For the building up of the body of Christ. Look at verse 13. What's that word it starts off with in verse 13? Till. Till. You know what that tells me? That's a time frame. See, if I tell you, well, you know, we're going to go, you know, um, we're going to go hang out until 2 o'clock. That means, well, it's already 2 o'clock, so i got to go. But <laughs> yeah, We're going to go hang out. We're going we're to go hang out till 5. But that means we're going to go do that. We're going to hang out. We're going to fellowship until 5, and then at 5, I'm going to leave. Right? There's a time frame that's set there. So it says that these ministers are given to the body of Christ to build you up, to edify you, till or until we all come to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man. I keep hearing this word perfect thrown around. Are you seeing it too? Yeah. 
it seems like this word perfect is just being thrown around. All these scriptures, perfect here, perfect there, perfect men, perfecting of the saints. See, there, there, there is, the, it's, it's the gospel, or it's not the, the gospel, it's the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And part of the doctrine of Jesus Christ is the doctrine of perfection, the doctrine of maturity, growing up into the fullness of Him. Watch what it says here. Unto a perfect man, unto the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ. Now watch this, church. See that word measure? That Greek word is meta. Meta is the Greek word, which literally means like a measurement. It would be like if I was to take a ruler out and actually line a ruler out, and let's just say, you know, for argument's sake, let's say Jesus is 6'1". I'm saying that because I'm 6'1". No, I'm just <laughs> Jesus is 6'1", right? That's the meta, the measurement. It's saying that we're actually measuring Jesus, and then we're going to bring you up alongside and see if you line up. So to the measurement, now watch this, he says, to the measure and of the stature. Now stature, so measurement is do you line up, stature is position. How many in the military? You got some, got some military people in here? I got a few, okay. Now watch this. How many know when you stood before your drill sergeant, your sergeant, your, your commanding officer, how many know you had to have some stature? You had to, you know, maybe put your hand, if you're at ease, you put your hands behind your back, your, your feet are shoulder length, you're, you know, you're standing tall, you've got your chest out, you're, I mean, you're standing there proud. Why? Because you're an American soldier. You don't, you know, you didn't stand before your commanding officer like this, did you? <laughs> it wouldn't have ended well for you, would it? <laughs> right? You had some stature. Well, that's exactly what this word's talking about. You look just like him. If Jesus is standing here like this, guess what you're doing? You're standing there like that. See, you got to understand this, church. When you, you, if you're walking in the fullness of Christ and maturing into Him, when you walk into a room, the devil can't tell if Jesus or you just walked in. Amen. That stature. You should walk in the same stature of Jesus Christ Himself. You could walk into a room full of witches, and all them witches don't know if God just walked in or you walked in. Why? Because how many know Ephesians chapter 6 says that you are clothed in the armor of God. How many of you know, when the enemy comes, when the enemy sees God, watch, let me back up. When the enemy sees the armor of God coming at him, who do you think he's, who, he's got to be thinking, who's in there? Who do you think's in there? God. And yet you're in God's armor. So when you run at the enemy, all the enemy sees is here comes God. Because I'm in his armor. You getting this? Now watch. To grow up into the fullness of a son, unto a perfect man, of the measure meta, of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about by every wind of doctrine. How many know people are carried about by winds of doctrine today? Every newfangled teaching that comes out, people are all, you know, oh, have you heard of this new teaching? Heard of that new teaching? There's no new teachings. The teachings are the teachings of Jesus Christ. Paul's teachings were the continued teachings of Jesus Christ. Peter's teachings were the continued teachings of Jesus Christ. There's no new teachings. The, the kingdom has been revealed. There's no new revelations. Now, it may be a new revelation to you because it's now being revealed to you, but the, God isn't sending down new revelations from heaven to people. God, he's been revealed. Now it's up to you to actually see Him for who He is. And not, now watch this. When you actually see Him for who He is, then you see you for who you've been created to be. It's like you, watch, beholding in a mirror the glory of God. This is the mirror that you stand in front of now. And you look into this mirror and you should see your reflection. I tell you, one of the, one of the major things that actually just transformed and changed my life and the way I saw myself is when I actually began to read this word and actually put me in it. That every time I saw the name of Jesus, I must be doing good, she just gave me a 10. <laughs> now watch this. <laughs> every time I look in this, I should see, watch, I should see myself. I should, every time I see Jesus in the scripture, I should see myself there. Why? Because everything I do is now in his name, which I told you this yesterday, means in his stead. See, Acts 10.38 how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. 
Now watch. What, if, you go, if you look up Acts 10.38 in my Bible, it'll actually, I, have it, I have my name right above Jesus' name, and I put my town right above Nazareth. So my Bible actually says how God anointed Shane Smith of Littlestown, Pennsylvania, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. You've got to put your name in there. You're just like Jesus. He says, it's enough. It's good that you be just like me. So if you better find Acts 10, 38 and put your name in the Bible there. Now, if you got a Bible that you can't write in, this is what Brother Curry would say, go put that thing on a little shrine in your house somewhere and then run out to Walmart and get one that you can scribble in and highlight. I'm telling you, you look through my Bible, it's all marked up. It's all highlighted. It's all written in. Why? Because this is God's love letter to me. And I read it, and I'm like, oh, man, I can't believe he said that about me. I'm going to write something. Well, because he's, he's speaking to me this, and he's showing me this, and I'm underlining this and highlighting that. And this, is, this, is, this is what we should be in. We should be immersed into this word. Now, he says here, that we henceforth be no more children. Everybody say, I'm not a child. I'm not a child. Say, I'm a, I'm a son. Maturing, Maturing. into the fullness now watch this, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. You know, one of the winds of doctrine, I think, uh, I think Brother Matt shared on this yesterday about, our, yeah, I think it was yesterday, about generational curses. There's a, see, the enemy's not, not up to any new tricks. He, he's doing the same thing that he's been doing for thousands of years. The only thing he does is he kind of rebrands it and changes it a little bit so you think it's something new. Generational curses have been rebranded, and it's coming back around now, and now they're calling it courts of heaven. Yeah. There's a whole ministry out there about the courts of heaven, and you got to go, what you do is you go into the courts of heaven, and Jesus is your advocate, and the devil is the lawyer. The lawyer, you know, he's the prosecutor, and the father is the judge, and you've got to plead your case. And you've got to repent for your sins. You've got to repent for the past sins of your parents and your grandparents and your, all these people. And then watch, Jesus is your advocate. You know, it's, all this, it's like this courtroom thing. And then you have to see what the verdict is. That's called generational curses rebranded. That, the enemy's bringing that back around now. And the church is falling for it. No new doctrines. People are moved by every little new thing that comes along. Can't be like that. We have to be mature. We have to be solid. We have to be steady. So why? Now watch, he says, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and the cunning craftiness wherewith, or whereby they lied in wait to deceive. You know what they want? They want your money. Because if they can keep you coming back, well, you know, come to my deliverance program. It only costs you $150 a session. When did you ever see Jesus charge people to get free? You don't see it in the scripture. How many know the gospel is free? Amen. Healing is free. Amen. Deliverance is free. Provision is free. Peace is free. Joy is free. It's the kingdom of God. The kingdom is free. You don't have to pay a thing for it. So if you're sitting in a minister or you're sitting, well, if you're watching TV especially, because all they want is money. You, know, you hear these TV preachers? Sow a seed. You'll get your healing. Ah, guess what? The seed's already been sown, brother. It's called Jesus Christ. He went into the ground and he rose up a son. And when he came out of that grave, I came out with him. So it's too late. You know, sow a seed. Your family gets saved. Nope. Again, he was the seed. I don't need to do anything else for my family to be saved. Now, I can preach to him. I can pray for him. I can believe for him. But I don't need to put finances in nobody else's pocket so that my family can get saved. Why? Because these people are deceiving Christians. That's why, that's why we don't do uh, offerings. Uh, we don't do, take, receive up offerings on healing services, and those, those bookstores will be closed. Why? Because even that, people, people relate that. If I go buy a book, I'll get my healing. People relate sowing money to getting or receiving something. You cannot buy healing. If you try to put money in my hand or Matt's hands uh, on the healing night, we will literally drop it and walk away because we will not receive it. It is one of the quickest ways to get fired from JGLM is if you receive money for healing or for prayer for healing. We won't do it. It's one of our principles we live by. We will not receive money. So don't tempt me. Don't even try. I won't even take it. So I won't even take it. But watch. 
<clears throat> people are, but you have a lot of people out there that are deceiving Christians, and they're deceiving because they want to get their pockets lined. Okay? Now watch this, verse 15. But speaking the truth in love. Everybody say, speaking the truth in love. But speaking the truth in love, that's what we do. Watch, when we do declarations in the morning, we're speaking that truth in love. We're declaring. We're, we're doing that. We're doing Philippians. Watch, we're, by acknowledging every good thing that God, is, that God has placed in us, we're making effective our faith. Amen. Amen? And so watch this. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in Him in all things, which is the head, Christ. Now, see, I just read that wrong. And none of you caught that, did you? Ah, some of you caught it. But you know, a lot of ministers will read that wrong and you won't even catch it. They'll say, they'll say, but grow, yeah, I'll repeat it wrong one more time. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. It says, not, it doesn't say in, does it? It says in too. See, that one little word makes a huge difference in that sentence. If I say I'm growing up in Littlestown, Pennsylvania, that's where I'm growing up in. I'm not growing up into a town. I'm growing up in that town. If I say I'm growing up in Christ, well, that's just a, state, a blank statement. I'm in Christ. I'm growing up in Christ. But what am I growing up into? Well, I don't know. I'm just growing up in Christ. But if I say I'm growing up into Christ in all things, there's a point to be reached, and that means that I'm growing up into Him. How many of you ever heard a child say, well, when I get old, when I grow up, I want to be a firefighter, or I want to be an astronaut, or I want to be this. I want to grow up into being that. That's the exact same principle that God is saying here. You are growing up into Jesus Christ. So, again, He's the measure, the meta, the stature that we measure ourselves against, and we say, am I there yet? The only one that we can put ourselves up against. Now watch. God sets the standard high. One more scripture, we're going to have to wrap this up. 1 John chapter 2. Verse 4, he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. You know what that's called? That's called God's litmus test. That's how you know whether people are actually Christians, born again, believers. Because if they say they know him, but they don't do the things that Jesus commanded them to do, they don't know him. But whosoever keepeth his word, him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that says he abides in him ought himself also walk even as he walked. Do you see that? If you say that God abides in you or Jesus abides in you and you in him, then you ought to walk just as Jesus himself Walked. Let's do one more. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, now we are the sons of God. When? Now. now. It doesn't say when we get to heaven we'll be sons of God, does it? It says now. Where are you, where are you a son right now? Right now? Right now. Now we are the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Now, this scripture has caused a little bit of confusion. The only difference between you and Christ right now is He has glorified flesh and you don't yet. Notice I said yet. Because every, every one of us one day will receive our glorified flesh. I told you mine's going to be a little skinnier. <laughs> even though I'm working on some of this. But watch this. Some of you will have more hair. <laughs> But you're going to have glorified flesh one day. Now watch, that's the only difference. I want you to do something. This is a, this is a really, we're going to do a little practice thing. Everybody got a pen? Everybody a pen? You're going to, you're going to, we're going to do some parentheses really quick here. Okay? Here in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, the first parentheses I want you to put is here. Beloved, now we are the sons of God. Put that in parentheses. This is something I'm teaching you how to actually break down the word and see it for what it says. So beloved, now we are the sons of God. When are we the sons of God? Okay, here's the next parentheses. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. Put that in parentheses. What is he talking about? It does not yet appear what we shall be. He's talking about when we get our glorified flesh. I don't know what I'm going to look like then, but right now I'm a son. Okay? So it does not yet appear what we shall be. Now here's the next one. But we know that when he shall appear. Put that in parentheses. When's his, okay, how, you know, how many know he's already came once? But how many know he's coming again? 
Come on. He's coming again. And when he comes again, he's not going to look like the little baby in a manger, is he? He's coming back as the righteous judge with fire in his eyes. He's going to come back, and the Bible says he's going to rule with an iron rod. I mean, this is going to be a big deal. He ain't coming back as no little sissy Jesus. He's coming back as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And the Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. I see, I got this picture because I've met some hard-nosed atheists and I've seen people even online that says, even if the true God stood before me, I wouldn't bow to worship him. You know what the picture I have in the back of my head is an angel with a staff popping him in the back of the knee and then falling down. Why? Because the Bible says every knee shall bow. Now watch this. He's, he's going to appear. Now, when he appears, it says that he comes on the clouds. Okay, that's not the puffy, white, billowy ones. When the Bible refers to clouds in the Bible, when it refers to clouds, it actually refers to people. Don't you know that you're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, saints that have went before you. When Jesus ascended into heaven, it says that he, the clouds received him. What was that? That was when he descended into hell and preached to the captives and led the cap- led captivity captive. He led them out of captivity. And what he did is he ascended to heaven with those captives that he led out of captivity. Now watch this. When he comes again, he's going to appear on the clouds. And the Bible says we shall meet him in the air. Now here's something really neat. You ready to see this? In Thessalonians, when Paul talks about meeting him in the air, that word meet is the same word in the Greek that you would use to go out and greet a king or a dignitary and escort them into the city. So that means, because watch, people have this idea that when Jesus appears, we're just all going to get out of here. See, I think it's more victorious if when he appears, we all meet him and say, come with us. Let's go rule and reign with you. Get it? Okay, I'm just making sure you're getting that. Now watch this. He says, when he shall appear. So we know he's going to appear. Now here's the next parentheses. We shall be like him. Put that in parentheses. When he appears. Now watch. If you're left on this earth, when he appears, when he comes the second time, you're going to be just like him in the twinkling of an eye. In other words, your, your flesh is going to go right into immortal flesh. In, watch this. Corruption will put on incorruption. Mortality will put on immortality in a twinkling of an eye. You'll be changed. But right now, you're just like him. The only difference is he has glorified flesh and you don't yet. Now, one more and I promise I'm done. 1 John chapter 4 verse 17. Herein is our love made Man, that word has been thrown around this whole session. (laughs) Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as He is, so are we in this world. Now that doesn't say as He is, so are we when we get to heaven. It says right now. Everybody say "Right right now. Right now, as He is, so are you in this world. Everybody say right now. Right now. Right now. I'm just, like I'm just like Jesus. Right now, right now in, this world, in this world, I am a son. I am a son. I'm a son of God. A son of God. The, Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit lives in me, lives in me dwells, in me, dwells in, me. in me. He remains. He, remains. he, doesn't, come and go. he doesn't come and go. He abides. He abides. In, John 14, in John chapter 14, you said, you said that if we love you, Father, that you would come to us and you would make your home with us. So right now, I am the address of God. Do you believe that? Then give God glory. Amen. Come on up, sister. Come on up.